Why did the Negro leave the South in the 1900s? The Great Migration was one of the most significant movements of people in the United States history. Approximately 6 million black people moved from the American South to Northern, Midwestern, and Western states, roughly from the 1910s until 1970s. Why does the Negro leave the South? <laughs> Indeed, you would feel a large part of the answer if you could be on this train, in this Jim Crow car, and share for one night the longing of these people to reach the line that divides Dixie from the rest of creation. As soon as I got on that train, I felt free. Sure, I was sitting in the Jim Crow section up front where all the coal and dust rose up, got in the windows and ruined my clothes. But the chugging of the train couldn't hardly keep up with the beating of my heart. Just behind us is a car for white people where they can stretch out and rest their heads. They have paid exactly the same fares as we have. Some of these colored men are in the service of the United States, summoned from the far corners of Texas to fight for democracy in Europe. This is certainly a good preparation for trench warfare. We were hoping we'd see the Mason-Dixon line. I thought it would look like a line of trees with some kind of white mark in the middle. Then someone said, the bridge ahead was in. We were north now. The great migration of black people began because of disenfranchisement, hate crimes, and Jim Crow laws, which left many African Americans hoping for a new life up north. Most blacks worked as sharecroppers, trapped in an endless cycle of debt and poverty. In the 1980s, a bow weevil blight damaged the cotton crop throughout the southern region, increasing misery. All these factors served to push African Americans to seek better lives. The booming northern economy and the industrial jobs were numerous, and factory owners wanted sources of cheap labor. The Harlem Renaissance refers to an era of written and artistic creativity among African Americans that occurred in New York and spread to other cities during the 1920s and the 1930s. It has been considered by many to be the high point in African-American writing. The Renaissance was not a school and the writers associated with it didn't share a common purpose. However, they had a common bond. They dealt with black life from a black perspective. The Harlem neighborhood in New York City was a black cultural mecca in the 1920s. The Renaissance was first given a clear voice by Howard University professor Alan Locke in his carefully conceived The New Negro Movement, which he published in the March 1925 issue of Survey Graphic Magazine. Locke's manifesto with its supported essays and poetry by other black writers insisted that modern American-born blacks needed to focus on African music and artistic heritage to form a new ism peopled with Africanist or neo-primitivist. Although he recognized that the movement had outposts in other northern cities, he established Harlem as his epic center. He states, Harlem is neither slum, ghetto, resort, or colony, though it is in part all of them. It is or promises at least to be a race capital. He wrote in his essay entitled Harlem, and I quote, Europe seethes in a dozen centers with eminent nationalities, Palestine full of a reminisce Judaism. These are no more alive with the spirit of a racial awakening than Harlem. Culturally and spiritually, it focuses as a people. Negro life is not only founding new sinners, but finding a new soul. End of quote. The expression of that new soul would be a Negro Zionism. Locke argued in 
Enter the New Negro, another essay in Survey Graphic that makes a case for African Americans to use a central place as a source for political change. He wrote, and I quote, he says, Harlem has the same role to play for the New Negro as Dublin had for New, Ar New Ireland or Prague for the New Czechoslovakia, end of quote. Locke, who was born in 1886, was not only a champion for the movement, but he became a sort of liaison between the white university establishment and the inner city artists, a job for which he was well suited. In addition to being the first black Rhodes Scholar, he graduated magnum cum laude from Howard University in 1907. He studied philosophy at Oxford University in England and the University of Berlin. By 1912, he was an associate professor at Howard University and later advanced to become a full professor. Over the next 35 years, he used his position at the university as ground zero for the new Negro movement. He dedicated himself to finding and promoting young artists, writers and artists, and acted as a guiding force behind this new generation. He believed freedom and social change could come from art and artistic expression. Alain Leroy Locke, Dr. Locke, as he seriously described himself, was the first black Rhodes scholar ever. A black man whose works on aesthetics you know, uh, was carried in the Encyclopedia Britannica and all. A man of some intellectual uh, and artistic eminence. Now, but he didn't rest on his academic laurels. He was an active man. For example, he went all the way to Europe in search of a young poet whose works he had read young poet named Langston Hughes, and it was Alain Leroy Locke who took Hughes from washing dishes, excuse me, in Paris, and sort of brought him back into the cultural mainstream of America. And another young lady showed up on campus named Zora Neale Hurston. It was Alain Leroy Locke who spotted her and sort of positioned her, you know, in the artistic firmament of the world. As, as we knew it. Uh, so now he was head of the philosophy department. I was a student in his philosophy class. Uh, there was a test and evidently my paper impressed him uh, enough, at least for him to invite me to his office and sit me down. Well, young man, uh, what do you do with yourself? And I explained to him uh, that I wanted to write plays. I wanted to be a playwright and write plays. And uh, he could hear from my accent that uh, maybe I wasn't so sure of exactly what I was talking about. He said, where are you from? I said, Waycross. He said, I, I, no, I mean, where are you from? The name of the town. I said, Waycross, George. He said, you want to write plays? I said, yes. You, uh, you go to the theater? Said, yeah. Yes, sir. Saturday, we go see the cowboy picture. He said, no, 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 no. Well, do you go? Have you ever been in a place where there are live people up on stage? And I said, well, we used to do the Easter, the Christmas pageant and stuff in high school. He said, yeah, but I mean, uh, and I'd seen some of the minstrel shows they came to. So, but, but the theater, sir, young man, have you been to the theater? <clears throat> Excuse me. And it turned out that I hadn't. I was in Washington. And this is how the university was the Howard Players. I had no idea who the Howard Players were or what they were involved in. He said, you, you're going to write plays and you don't even know what the theater <laughs> is? I said, well, yes, sir. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I suggest that when you finish here, go to Harlem 
but there's a little theater group called the Rose McClendon Players just being formed. Tell them that I sent you. Ask for Dick Campbell and Bureau of Ron and ask them to accept you. If they do, joy this little theater company. And once you do, do everything that's possible for you to do while you're there. Uh, build scenery, paint sets, hustle lemonade, pass out programs, act, sing, dance, direct, whatever. And that way you find out at least what the theater is like and whether or not you can uh, write for it. And I was so convinced that this was exactly the information that I had come to college to get that I didn't stay to finish. As what happened? I, as quickly as I could, uh, I decided that I would go to New York, find this Harlem, find this group, try to join it, and if they let me, do exactly what Dr. Locke had advised. And uh, after some adventures, uh, that's exactly what happened. I finally came to Harlem, found that group, joined up, got into the theater, and sort of been there ever since. When you went to Harlem after dropping out of Howard University, you were at Howard for three years, three right? Years, yes. So you just have one more year to go. Yes, <laughs> but I, somehow, <clears throat> somehow I didn't seem to need that. Also. At that time, it was necessary to have taken a course in the ROTC to graduate. And for some reason, <laughs> I couldn't bring myself to take a course in the ROTC. I, I said, why do I need that? No, all I need is the address of the road of the players and Dr. Locke, to whom I owed 25 or 50 bucks or so, because <laughs> he, you know, he, oh, he was a marvelous man. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Locke gave me this recommendation, and I'm off. If Elaine Locke gave the Renaissance a voice, then Marcus Garvey gave the Renaissance a purpose. Born in Jamaica, Marcus Garvey was an orator for the Black nationalism and Pan-Africanism movement. He founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Community Leagues. Garvey advanced a Pan-African philosophy, which inspired a global mass movement called Garveyism. Garveyism would inspire others, such as the Nation of Islam and the Rastafarian movement. In the post-World War I economic crisis, with racial discrimination, lynching, and poor housing, masses of black people were ready for a leader who was aggressive and planned to, and I quote, uplift the race, end of quote. The UNIA snowballed. By 1919, there were over 30 branches throughout the United States, the Caribbean, Latin America, and Africa. Garvey claimed that over a million people had joined his organization in three years. Garvey's movement was the first black attempt to combine modern urban goals and a mask organization. Most leaders did not try to create black economic institutions. Still, Garvey had demonstrated to them that the urban masses were a potential powerful force in the struggle for black freedom. Garvey's goals were modern and very urban. Garvey wanted to end the imperialistic rule and create modern African societies, not as his critics claimed to transport blacks back to Africa. He combined black communities on three continents with his newspaper, The Negro World, and in 1919 formed the Black Star Line. The line was an international shipping company to provide transportation and encourage trade among black businesses of Africa and the Americas. In the same year, he founded the Negro Factories Corporation to establish such businesses. In 1920, he presided over the first of several international conventions of the UNIA. Garvey wanted to guide the new black militants into one organization that could overcome class and national divisionism.
Marcus Garvey wanted to return African Americans to Africa to create a vibrant black nation empowered through economic independence. Although some of his goals were controversial, his crusade would inspire leaders from Malcolm X to Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela. Garvey was certainly a controversial figure, but the concepts that we now think of as black nationalism and black pride started with Garvey's pronouncement. Marcus Mosiah Garvey was born in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica on August 17, 1887. Beginning as a printer's apprentice at 14, Garvey became a union organizer and later worked various jobs across Central America. Marcus Garvey found wherever he went, black people of African heritage in, in particular were always on the lower stratification end of society. This had a profound impact on him. Particularly, his concern was for the uplift of African people globally. In 1912, Garvey sailed to London, England and took night courses at Birkbeck College. After working for a pan-African newspaper, Garvey returned to Jamaica in 1914 and formed the United Negro Improvement Association, or UNIA. The UNIA was about black self-determination. It was about galvanizing the ideas of black repatriation to the motherland, the continent of Africa. And it was extremely important in terms of getting black people to understand self-pride, pride in one's race. Inspired by Booker T. Washington to raise funds and start his own school, Garvey came to the United States in 1916 and in 1918 began publishing the Negro World newspaper. Garvey was extremely outspoken. He was, some people would say, almost bombastic. He wanted to take over Africa and had elected himself as president of Africa without consulting the Africans, unfortunately. Determined to achieve economic independence for African Americans, Garvey launched the Negroes Factories Association in 1919 and a shipping company called the Black Star Line, which he planned to use to transport passengers back to Africa. Garvey was a great organizer, but unfortunately not a great businessman. During the time that Garvey and the UNIA were trying to launch the Black Star Line, they solicited funds from investors for stock options through the mail. And this resulted later on in allegations of mail fraud and Garvey was convicted uh, and sent to prison. After serving five years in prison, Garvey was deported. He eventually moved to London and in 1938, he supported the Greater Liberia Act, created by known white supremacist, Senator Theodore Bilbo from Mississippi. Marcus Garvey's association with Senator Bilbo is related more on a practical level rather than an intellectual like for each other. Marcus Garvey's attempt to help Africans in America leave and go to Africa fell in line with some aspects of KKK philosophy. Garvey died in London on June 10, 1940. He was reinterred in Jamaica in 1964 and is hailed as Jamaica's first national hero and the prophet of the Rastafarian religion. Although Garvey was a flawed leader, he's someone who is really important to the history of the black radical tradition. He was probably one of the strongest voices of black nationalism in history. Now that we have a foundation of the Harlem Renaissance, let's talk about the music and the literature. Most music and literature from the Harlem Renaissance have been assimilated into mainstream American culture today. A good example would be the Apollo Theater. I don't know how many of you have been to the Apollo Theater, but it is very much part of the American identity.
Now with you tonight is a talent review that we've had here at the theater since 1934. The performers come out on stage, they rub the, the tree of hope, and they perform. They perform for an audience of 1,500 people. The audience chooses whether or not they think that person is worthy of their performance or not. If they are deemed not worthy either by their performance or their singing, the audience gets to boo them off stage. Lauren Hill, she got booed on the stage when she was on Amber Tonight, and she was 13 years old. Oh, Amber Tonight the Apollo is integral to the living history of the Apollo Theater, particularly for future generations because it's still the place where stars are born and legends are made. When new performers come in, and they're nervous and jittery about getting on the stage, I always tell them to give it their all. Don't think about the audience, just think about your talent, focus, and give everything in your entire being into your performance. Most people don't know that so many of the legends in entertainment either got started here or played the Apollo Theater. Now this is our wall of legends. Now these are photos of people who performed here back in the 60s to sold out shows. Uh, Sam and Dave, you know, they had that song, I'm a soul man. Da -da 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 -da. Well, some of my favorite performers at the Apollo have always been the Motown review. You talk about the Temptations, the Supremes, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, all those groups on one show. It was heaven. The Apollo Theater was built in 1914. The building was originally called Hertig and Siemens New Burlesque Theater. Then in 1934, the building was renamed the Apollo Theater. They based the name Apollo on uh, the Greek god that represents the sun and music, entertainment, poetry. Businesses started thriving. People would go out and buy new costumes or outfits to wear to a show at the Apollo. They would go and visit the restaurants and, and eat before and after a show. It was a time in black culture, theater, literature, activism. Uh, it was very, very popular in this area. The influence that these performers had as part of that Harlem Renaissance was felt by the owners and the customers who attended this theater at that time. Our main focus with preservation is to restore the gilding on all the box seats as well as the um, ornamentation above the theater and on the ceiling. And so that's what we are hoping to really bring out the beauty and, and of, the, of the theater because at one point, you know, those, those shine beautifully gold. Talent is born here, music is born here, culture is born here. This place defines culture. It's the place when someone, when a major icon like Whitney Houston passes away, this is the place that people come to mourn her. So it's not just a historic symbol, um, it's more a living cultural vessel. It's a pleasure to present to you, Cab Calloway. At the Apollo Theater.
The music of Betsy Smith, Dizzy Gillespie, and Louis Armstrong, pioneers that gave way to careers of iconic performers such as Billie Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald in the 1930s and 40s, are now American standards. The major writers of the Harlem Renaissance are Claude McKay, Conti Cullen, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, Randolph Fisher, James Weldon Johnson, and Jean Toomer. Langston Hughes, Josephine Baker, and Zora Neale Hurston have made it into pop American culture. This is Claude McKay. He was born September the 15th, 1889 in Jamaica, before going to the U.S. in 1912. He wrote two volumes of Jamaica dialect verse titled Songs of Jamaica and Copstone Ballad. After publishing his first books of poetry, Claude McKay moved to Harlem, New York, and established himself as a literary voice for social justice during the Harlem Renaissance. In 1928, his book Home to Harlem was the most popular novel written by an American Black person for that time. Claude McKay is known for his novels, essays, and poems, including one of my favorite, If We Must Die, as well as Harlem Shadows. If We Must Die is the poem that makes me a poet among colored Americans. If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and penned in an inglorious pot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us though dead. O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men we'll face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying but fighting back. Conti Cullen was also a prominent Black American poet during the Harlem Renaissance. Conti Cullen was born May 30, 1903, in Louisville, Kentucky, and was later un unofficially adopted by Reverend F. A. Cullen, minister of Salem M. E. Church, one of Harlem's largest congregation. As a schoolboy, he won a citywide poetry contest and saw his winning stanza widely repr reprinted. In 1925 at New York University, he won the Witter Biner po Poetry Prize and was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. After finishing college at NYU and beginning a master's degree at, at Harvard, Cullen published his first volume of poetry titled Colored. During the next four years, Cullen published his poems and edited poetry by other African Americans. In 1928, he was awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship to write poetry in France. In 1932, Cullen published his only novel, One Way to Heaven, a social comedy of the disparity between lower class African Americans and the elites of New York City. Although he often focused on racial ideas and discrimination, Cullen was never considered radical and was often criticized by African-American community for being too, and I quote, safe. He wrote about various themes and did not necessarily wish to be regarded as a writer, primarily focusing on race or politics. All right, go on there. Oh, her dramatic walk <laughs> to the microphone. Hey, 
black child. Do you know where you're going? Are you really going? Do you know you can learn what you want to learn? If you try to learn what you can learn. Hey, black child. Do you know you are strong? I mean, really strong. Do you know you can do what you want to do? If you try to do what you can do. Hey, black child. Be what you can be. Learn what you must learn. Do what you can do. And tomorrow, your nation will be what you want it to be. <laughs>
Far into the night and crooned that tune. The stars went out and so did the moon. The singer stopped playing and went to bed. While the weary blues echoed through his head. He slept like a rock or a man that's dead. Zora Neale Hurston was born on January 7, 1891, in Natasuga, Alabama. She claimed to be born in 1901 in Eatonville, Florida. She was, in fact, 10 years older and had moved with her family to Eatonville as a small child. Eatonville is the first incorporated all-black town in the country. Zora Neale Hurston was an American author anthropologist and filmmaker. She portrayed racial struggles in the early 1900s in the American South and published research on hoodoo. The most popular of her four novels is Their Eyes Were Watching God, published in 1937. It is a novel written in a Southern dialect that challenges the reader to enter a world of deep poverty and emotional suffering in a black and white world. It is standard lip reading at exclusive private all-girls schools and major universities. In many ways, the Harlem Renaissance has defined what we meant by American, be it literature or music. But who is Zora Neale Hurston? I am not tragically colored. There's no great sorrow damned up in my soul, nor lurking behind my eyes. I do not belong to the sovereign school of Negrohood, who hold that nature somehow has given them a low-down dirty deal, and whose feelings are all hurt about it. No. I do not weep at the world. I am too busy shopping my oyster name. Zora Neale Hurston journeyed deep into the South with the canine pen in hand, recording Negro folk culture. She wrote countless books, plays, and articles infused with the rhythm of her people. Zora's fame would come from one book, Their Eyes Were Watching God, but throughout her life, she was legendary for her spunk. She was bodacious, she was outrageous, she enjoyed shaking things up. She's a southern black woman who wants to be a scholar and a writer, living in a white world of letters. And there was one thing I liked about her, her independence. She didn't care about you and what you told me. Zora could go from dialect to the most beautiful English she could possibly imagine. It was like music when she spoke. Zora was kind of feisty and kind of raunchy. She could tell you to go to hell and make you enjoy the trip. few of the most popular writers during the Harlem Renaissance. 